I'm going to give you a brief overview of uh, an emerging issue uh, that's going to be on the radar for anybody who deals with humor, and that's antimicrobial resistance. And uh, my focus is mainly on antimicrobial resistance in the environment, and then the next speaker um, will be talking about antimicrobial resistance moving through the food part of the food chain. So the issue of agricultural use of antibiotics has really captured national attention. The main concern is the transfer of resistance from animals to humans via food, water, and the environment. Um, this is a, a this is a newspaper article, um, text from a newspaper article from 2012. A lot of the newspaper articles uh, out there are still being written uh, with this uh, uh, type of, of information. So I'm going to read the text. Using small amounts of antibiotics over long periods of time leads to the growth of bacteria that are resistant to the drug's effects, comma, Endangering humans become infected but cannot be treated with routine antibiotic therapy. So in isolation, this half of the sentence is true. Using antibiotics uh, does enrich for antibiotic resistant bacteria. And we humans, we are endangered by resistant infections. But the way that they stick this together um, leaves a, a lot of questions as far as what the actual connections between the two halves of um, these pieces are. And uh, soon I will go over a little bit of the evidence that leads us to believe that there's more to the story than uh, you might be reading in the newspaper. Um, but first, I wanted to just take an aside. Um, uh, kind of a view from the other side. So if this is all you know about the issue, what you read in the papers here, these two statements, antibiotics are used on the farm, uh, and there's resistance in the clinic, and they're implying that they're directly linked. Um, if this is all, and this is what most people, mo most people in the public, this is all the information they have on this. This is actually also um, the opinion that a lot of people coming through public health circles have on this. They don't have the ag background. This is all they know about the problem. Okay, so we were saying, if this is all you know about the problem, this is all the public is seeing, this is all the only pieces that that some people know about. Well, then, if this is what you if this is what you know, well, then the solution seems obvious. However, antibiotic resistance is much more complex than that. There's all of this going on in the middle, and. Um, there's a lot of different ways that things are connected. And in fact, this pretty diagram uh, leads you to believe that we actually know more about it than, than we do. In reality, uh, this is a more accurate representation of what we know. Um, we have enough of the puzzle pieces put together to have a good idea of who the major players are and what some of the possible relationships are. But there's still a lot of missing information, a lot that we don't know about how this actually works. There's a lot of assumptions that are being made that you hear about in the media um, that really aren't supported by the evidence. There's still a lot we need to learn about. What are the assumptions? Uh, the assumptions is that the use in the animals causes the resistance in the humans, that it's directly transferred, directly and immediately transferred. Uh, yeah, well, that's the question. That's what we're working on. There's a, uh, I guess what I'm they skip at is, over that part. I guess what I'm getting at is how do they make that leap to the connection between the animals and resistance in the through these antibodies? What's that premise? They must have a premise or base on what are they saying? Yeah, they, well, they skip from, well, what we know is that if you use an antibiotic in, in any system, in a human, in an animal, in the environment, you can select for resistance. So that's the one fact that they have that they start with. So that is true in humans? That's true in humans. It's true everywhere. Um, uh, and then they jump over all of the intermediate part 
to we're seeing infections in humans and that's something we need to do. Something we need to do. Yeah, but that's not the case. There's all kinds right. of other. That's, that's, that's what they're complaining That's what, that's what people. Story. And that's what they're implying. Nobody is really thinking about the role of the environment. How physically, like you're asking, how physically is the resistance transferred? We know that one possible route is through the food chain. John will talk about that because we know, oh, like pathogens can go through the food chain. So that's one possible route. But the environment is another big route. Um, that's not on people's radars. Okay, so how, what are some of the puzzle pieces that lead me to think there's more to the story than just this beginning piece and the end piece and that they're directly connected? Well, we know, we know that antibiotic resistance is ancient. Um, at the time of the woolly mammoths, um, they can go and find resistance genes genes that are resistant, code for resistance to a number of antibiotics. So the gene is a piece of the DNA that codes for the resistance. The gene is um, usually carried in a bacteria that's carried in the manure. Um, so that's how that's connected. We know that antibiotic resistance can be found in pristine habitats. This is a picture of a, um, of a cave in New Mexico. Folks hadn't been there for four million years. The researchers went in and they were able to culture bacteria that were resistant to 14 different antibiotics, including recently developed antibiotics. We know that antibiotic resistant bacteria can be found on organic, antibiotic free meat. In this study, they were looking at a particular kind of bacteria and a particular kind of resistance. They, this is one that's a particular problem in human health settings. Um, and they found no, no real difference between the, the conventionally raised swine and the swine from farms without antibiotics. There's a handful of these, re these retail studies out there where they'll go out and get the food and test it. Sometimes they find differences, sometimes they don't. In this instance, they didn't find any difference. We know um, that antibiotic resistance is common in environmental samples. Antibiotics, they come originally from soil bacteria. This is where they started out. Um, and the soil is really a vast reservoir of antibiotic resistance. You can test soil from across the globe. You can test it from um, native Nebraska prairies. You can test it from Antarctic um, ice cores and you find resistance. It's very broadly distributed in the environment. Um, and there's some work out there now looking at the idea that uh, some of the resistance that we see in humans actually comes from the environment and the soil reservoir as well. And finally, we know that antibiotic resistant bacteria are found in organic farming systems. This is uh, ARS work from a guy in Iowa. Um, even in the absence of the farm use of antibiotics, the resistance persisted. So their conclusion and kind of the point of this whole parade of, uh, of puzzle pieces is that these things, they, they suggest that there's going to be, we're going to need approaches in addition to the prudent use of antibiotics in, in order to effectively reduce antibiotic resistance. Right now, a lot of the focus is on uh, what antibiotics are fed to the animals, um, but there's a lot more to the issue than just that. And that alone, if your actual concern is public health, the, the, um, your loved ones who are in the hospital who have an antibiotic resistant infection, um, that is not going to solve, the, the focus on the drugs alone is, is not going to solve the resistance problem. So why am I talking about this on the demo day? Um, the animal manure is how the antibiotic resistant bacteria and the genes, they first enter the environment. The manure is a likely point of monitoring um, and a potential point for control. There's a 
There's a lot of interest in antibiotic resistance right now. There's a number of national and international surveillance programs that um, are either continuing or uh, being reevaluated, looking at being started, and manure is going to be on their radar. Um, there's other rumblings of uh, issues. Uh, there is a movement, it started mainly with environmental engineers, but now it's also spreading to some of the public health people, uh, an idea that antibiotic resistant genes, um, the, the lone DNA that codes for the um, resistance, the gene that's in the bacteria, that's in the manure, that the antibiotic resistance genes themselves should be considered as contaminants. Um, so, these are issues that people are discussing right now, and regardless of how they turn out, regardless of uh, whether you agree with um, how people are, are framing this issue or not, uh, manure is going to be getting attention as this um, issue gains momentum and also gains funding. Oh, I'm going back, because uh, I forgot the plus side. Um, on the plus side, um, there is strong evidence that the things that we are already doing um, in order to manage microbes in manure, uh, composting, digesters, land application, these same techniques, they also impact antibiotic resistant bacteria frequently um, and potentially in, in good ways as well. There's a lot of potential for manure impact to have a positive impact on controlling antibiotic resistance on the farm and preventing its transfer into, um, onto the human side of the equation. I wanted to close with a um, note on terminology. Um, the, the, the drugs that are of most concern for human health are antibiotics. Um, however, for a variety of reasons, people like to use the broader term antimicrobials. What's the difference between the two? I'm going to unpack this antimicrobial um, resistant suitcase here. Um, the antimicrobials uh, are actually uh, compounds that work against a variety of different microbes, antimicrobial um, viruses, bacteria, protozoa, fungi. Um, the antibiotics, they're focused just on the red part, the antibacterials. So antibiotics, they work against the bacteria. If we further unpack uh, the antibacterial suitcase here, uh, there's a variety of different compounds that are considered antibiotics. They include things like disinfectants, antiseptics, ionophores, as well as those drugs that are used by physicians. An ionophore. Um, it's a, it's, it's a drug that changes, I know the bacterial side of things. It's a drug that changes how cations are transported across bacterial membranes. Ah, th thank you. Yeah. Drugs used by humans, to, so you're going to, you hear, if, if you hear all of these terms being used in the discussion of the use of antibiotics in agriculture. Um, I think one of the things that's important um, to remember as, as the whole community moves forward with these kinds of discussions is uh, to, when we're talking about allocating resources is to try to focus that uh, on the most important part of the problem. And for us here, it's these drugs that are used by physicians to treat human infections. There's not that the other components aren't important, um, but this is our end goal and something that we need to stay focused on uh, as, as you move through the many different elements of this larger issue of uh, the use of antibiotics in, in, in agriculture. So that was it. Comments, questions, thoughts? One thing about the drugs.
some of those ideas as well. If you have questions or comments, if you're interested in an issue, if you want to talk more about the issue, call me. I'm happy to come out and um, share with you what I know of, of, about it and uh, things that I'm doing. These years have gone nuts to the point of having uh, a campaign or everywhere, having this, having all this stuff. You wonder when the CDC was trying to figure out that maybe you could go too far. And in most recent releases, they, uh, they indicate that you can go too far. <laughs> and maybe it's all right to have a few bacteria around our bodies that protect us. And uh, you can try to be too clean. You can try to be too, uh, and, and it gets you in trouble. I, you know, I just think of that, I mean, I think that fits right into what you talked about. And the fact that we should have a protocol in livestock on how we utilize these things, but the doctors need to have a protocol on how they're using them too, because they need to have that diversity, that different approaches at different times, and, you know, they need to keep it mixed up, just like anybody yeah. else. And, uh, you know, I you wonder whether or not some of that's, uh, some of that's happening the way it should. Yeah, do you think there's a lot of controls here? You should go to the human side of things. They, they have you know, they're, they're, they're a lot of controls. And then part of this, I think part of the, so it's always hard to separate these large issues. Um, I, I used to work a lot on um, E. coli over the 570 back in the day. And that too is similar to this in that the science and what's going on, what's really happening that's this part of this discussion. But that's the part that we can actually do something about that might actually matter. And trying to figure out a little bit more about what's happening here in the environment, identifying what are the important components, um, and then focusing our resources on that. Um, I think that's, that's what we need to do. Don't you think that part of the scientific fact of today's modern agriculture, though, is that when we have these large population centers of production, and I'm from Iowa, so I've seen birds actually rip through, you know, it's a virus, but they rip through, rip through the whole industry, and they try everything to stop the spread of that in these confined settings or whatever. I know that the situation could be that people from metropolitan areas observe agriculture and see what they're doing here in the One way, but from an economic standpoint, the viability of our economic uh, economy, uh, their agricultural economy, is the fact that these protocols, the flip side of what you're saying, is the fact that they are going to have to be pretty strictly looked at just because of one of the studies that Dr. Jacobson did, that, you know, I'm sure Dr. Jacobson at the Minnesota University of Study, uh, you know, all of this, is the fact that they did a study before the pork congresses, the two main ones in Iowa and Minnesota, for this particular PD issue. And one of the things that they found, which was very interesting, and I'm not sure if it was one from Nebraska, but we have convenience stores versus in every small town called you case that you might store for another chain called County Go. So they're very common centralized locations for farmers, for truckers, for families, for everybody. They went in and swabbed 150 various convenience stores in Minnesota and Iowa, and every one of them could possibly for PV. Uh, so I mean, there has to be a happy medium, but by the same token, when you have large populations, different to what we had 100 years ago in production, you know, we'll have to change our ways we do things as well, I think, just because it's, otherwise our whole farm economy is going to be And in fact, it's the economic forces that will drive any of exactly. the changes that we 